So welcome to everybody that's here in the building. And if you're watching online, a particular welcome to you um, for our Bible study. I was just mentioning earlier to the people in the building, if you're watching online, that next week we'll begin in a series looking at the book of Jonah. So please join us for that. But for today, we're going to take a look at the life of a key person in the Old Testament. Uh, a fascinating character in the Old Testament of Jacob. Now, I find the story of Jacob to be um, humorous at times, um, interesting at times, frustrating at times, but also full of hope for me because Jacob um, had a bit of a reputation he made a number of mistakes. Um, he was a coward on occasions. He was a deceiver and he was a liar. Yet God still chose to bless and use him. So we're going to consider one particular event in the life of Jacob. As you can see on the screen uh, behind me, it's the account of Jacob wrestling with God. And we find that in Genesis 32. But before we get to that, we're going to spend quite a lot of time, actually, um, looking at the character of Jacob, because that helps us to put that particular account that we're going to look at into some sort of context. So a bit of background. Jacob, as I'm sure many of you will know, was the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham. And he's also the twin brother of Esau. So Jacob and Esau were twins. And quite importantly to know, Jacob was the second twin out of the womb. As I said earlier, Jacob was a coward, a deceiver, a trickster. And not only that, he was a bit of a mummy's boy too. We read in Genesis 25 that one day Esau, his brother, was out hunting and Jacob was home cooking. Now Esau comes home from his hunting expeditions and he is starving hungry. And Jacob had been cooking some stew and he offers some to Esau who was clearly ravenous at this point, in exchange for his birthright. Now his birthright, I won't go into all the details about that, but basically to give up his birthright was giving up part of his inheritance. It was linked to land at that time, but Jacob, in exchange for some lentil stew, receives Esau's birthright. Jacob here, name it as it is, doing nothing other than preying on the vulnerable. Later, in Genesis 27, Jacob lies again. He pretends to be Esau, when in his father, who was clearly um, short of sight at this point, Jacob pretends to be Esau, who had a hairy arm. It's very bizarre, these stories. And as a result, received his father's blessing. Jacob masquerades as his brother Esau to receive his father's blessing. Blessing. And there's a lot we could look into about that, what that actually meant and how a few words from a father could give you such a blessing. But we, we don't have time for that today. But essentially, we need to know that in relation with his brother Esau, um, Jacob not only had stolen his birthright, but also masquerading as his brother had received 
his father's blessing. Now, the story goes on. Esau finds out and sets out to kill his brother. As a result, Jacob runs away from home, fearing for his life. He goes to his uncle, Uncle Laban, in a land far away. And Uncle Laban takes advantage of Jacob for around about 20 years. The story continues to get curious in Jacob's life. Jacob meets Laban's daughter, Rachel, and takes a shine for her. He agrees with Laban, her father, to work for seven years to earn the right to marry her. Now, he does that. He works for seven years, but then disaster strikes on their wedding night. You may know the story. Um, Laban is up to no good as well. But Jacob wakes up the morning after his wedding night and realize, realizes he slept with the wrong woman, the wrong sister. Jacob has spent his wedding night with Leah and not Rachel. I assume it was dark that night. But it's a big, yeah, big problem. Don't wake up the morning after your wedding with the wrong sister. So Jacob's in all kinds of um, turmoil here. And the result of that is that he has to do another seven years of work for Laban to get the hand of the right sister in marriage. Fourteen years of work just to get married. Anyway, and in this time that Jacob's away from his home, away from his father and his brother Esau, on the run essentially, in these 20 years he ends up with two wives and a couple of girlfriends too. In the space of seven years, he has 11 sons and a daughter with four different mothers. And I think my child tax credit form's complicated to fill in. Jacob's would have been a nightmare. And maybe some of you think that your life over the years has been a little complicated. Well, imagine Jacob's. Anyway. God tells him to leave Uncle Laban and go back to his family. And in the process, he effectively robs Laban. There's a very curious story about um, spotted and striped horses or goats, as I can't quite remember. Um, And um, he robs Uncle Laban. Laban and his sons discover this and set off to get him. And God appears to Laban, you read about this in Genesis 31, in a dream. And to paraphrase what God says to Laban, he says, mess with Jacob and you mess with me. So Jacob is being pursued by Laban. He's in fear of being pursued by his brother Esau, whom he robbed all those years ago. But remarkably, at the same time, Jacob is being pursued by God. So the next problem for Jacob is that by going home again, he's going to meet Esau, who the last time he saw him was out to kill him and has justification for his anger, having had his father's blessing stolen from him. So, if you read the accounts of what happens here, you you read that Jacob sends his messengers ahead of him, and they come back to inform him that they'd come across Esau, who is on his way, having heard that Jacob is en route. Esau is on his way to meet him, And he has 400 men with him. So you can understand 
that Jacob, at this point, is just a little bit worried. Now, I'm going to turn to some scripture, not to the scripture that we're going to look at in a minute, but just look at this prayer that Jacob prays. It's in Genesis 32, and I'm going to read from verse 9. Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. Now he prays at this point, not out of habit, but out of necessity. He's fearful. And that's often my experience. My prayer life is often responding to a certain situation, and the necessity of that situation causes me to turn to God. I wonder if that's your experience too, that we pray often out of necessity. My desire is that my prayer life would be transformed, that I'd pray more out of habit as opposed to just when something happens which causes me to turn to God. And Jacob's prayer here is essentially this. You were faithful to granddad. Uh, you were faithful to dad. And now I need you to be faithful to me. Help. That's his prayer. And in his prayer, he quotes scripture. He says this, I will, you know, he reminds God of, of the promise. He says, well, you have said, God, I will make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. And having quoted the scriptures, he says, save me from the hand of my brother. It's quite a good pattern, actually, to use scripture in our prayers. remind ourselves of the truth of the scripture and then apply that to the situation that we're in. You may be reading the Bible and read something like, um, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful always to do what is right in the sight of everybody. Those words kind of trip off the tongue until you're in a situation where somebody is been evil to you and you've just read a scripture that says do not repay anyone evil for evil and whilst things may not seem fair it's times like that that we can resort to referring to scripture and then saying well God just help me in this situation to apply that so Jacob prays and says, God, you've given a command, you've made a promise, but I am scared. He's scared for his life. Well, if you read on in chapter 32, after praying, he then plans how to best kind of suck up to his brother. In essence, as you read the account, he seems to doubt the ability of God to answer his prayer. And Jacob sends a bunch of gifts ahead to Esau, hoping that may sweeten 
the confrontation that is about to happen. Jacob sends these gifts ahead, goats and ewes and rams and camels and cows and donkeys. And having sent them, he then sends his family on ahead and he chooses to stay where he is all alone. And at this point, we have one of the most peculiar encounters in the whole of the Bible. And we're going to read the scriptures now. It's quite a long introduction. The introduction is going to be longer than the rest of the study. But let's look at these words from scripture. So I'm reading from chapter 32 of Genesis, and I'll read 22 to 32. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. It's fascinating, isn't it? Story. Really interesting story. Now you know why Jews don't eat hips <laughs> or sockets or something. If you've learned nothing else today, you can link it back to this story. So Jacob's here all alone, and someone shows up to toughen Jacob up. It's as if he's saying, come on, Jacob, man up. This is not a play fight. It seems to be the real thing. And it goes on through the night. Now, who is he fighting with here? It just says Jacob wrestled with a man. Well, to do this, or to try and work this out, you need to think with your kind of trinity heads on. I don't know um, if you've got a trinity head, but we need to try and get a head round the fact that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. We read later on in the Old Testament, it's in Exodus 33, that God the Father tells Moses that you cannot see the face of God and live. It's 
what it says in Exodus 33, 20. You cannot see the face of God and live. Yet here, the title of our passage, if you're looking in in your Bibles, is that Jacob is wrestling with God. And in verse 30, Jacob calls the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face. That's why it call, he calls the place Peniel. Peniel meaning the face of God. So something seems a little odd here in that Moses is told you cannot see the face of God and live. Yet Jacob says, I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Now, to get a clue on this, we can turn to Charles Wesley. It's a great thing to do. You're in a Methodist church. We can turn to Charles Wesley in one of his hymns. He wrote a hymn um, we, we could sing it if we were allowed to, but we're not. Um, and I can't sing either, so we won't try. Um, Charles Wesley wrote a hymn about this particular piece of Scripture. And in it, there's a verse that goes like this. I'll read the verse to you. In vain thou strugglest to get free, I never will unloose my hold. Art thou the man that died for me? The secret of thy love unfold. Wrestling, I will not let thee go till I thy name, thy nature know. Wesley, in this hymn, is trying to get us to see that the man wrestling with Jacob, the man who longs to bless him is the Son of God himself. It's what the theologians refer to as a Christophany. Um, And I I don't want to bore you with long words, but a a kind of pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God of Christ. There are many of them through the Old Testament. It may be a good Bible study series for the future where we can play a game of um, where is the Son of God throughout Scripture. And many Christians may think, well, he, he appears as a baby in Bethlehem, and that is true. But the Son of God, when, um, when we read in the Scriptures of the creation of the world, we read in Psalm 33 that one day from the breath of God the heavens were made And then as we read John's gospel, the star, it says, talking of Christ, in him, nothing was made that was not made through him. John tells us it was Christ that breathed one day and everything that we knew came into being. And here he is in the middle of the night, seemingly in the middle of nowhere, fighting with a deceiver and a liar and a thief. And it is in this wrestling that Jacob, although well advanced in years, finally becomes a man. I wonder how this would have looked. I wonder if the Son of God came up from behind him and uh, kind of jumped out of a bush and shocked him and scared him. Did this man who Jacob didn't know, start an argument that got out of hand. We don't know. What we do know is that Jacob gets the socket of his hip wrenched, and God says, let me go. And Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Have you ever fought with God? 
Not, not like this. That's never happened to me. I've not had the pre-incarnate son of God um, jump out from behind a bush and wrestle all night. I know a little bit what it's like to feel like I'm wrestling with God, though. Sometimes our life as Christians might be a bit of a, a struggle. And I, I wonder how determined we are to receive a blessing from God. We live in an age where um, most things that we want is kind of readily and easily available to us. It's not like that everywhere in the world, I know. Um, but some things are worth fighting for. And a blessing from God is one of those. Jacob is asked in the, in the process... What is your name? Do you know God never asks a question because he, he needs information. If God ever asks you a question, it's for your benefit, not his. But Jacob is asked, what is your name? As I was reflecting on that, I think that's really significant that he's asking that. Jacob's father Isaac once asked him the same question to which Jacob lied and said he was called Esau and received his father's blessing. Perhaps God is asking Jacob this question to remind him where he's come from. Well, this time Jacob tells the truth and says, my name is Jacob. Jacob means deceiver and coward. But Jacob says, even though I may take matters into my own hand, I want you to bless me. And our reason for hope, I said at the start, that in the story of Jacob, I find such hope. And our reason for hope is this, that God changes Jacob's name. Jacob becomes what Paul, the apostle, refers to as a new creation in Christ. Jacob's name is changed to Israel, meaning one who struggles with God and overcomes. And through this man, Jacob, with such a bad history, of deception, of lying, of theft. Through this man come the 12 sons who make up the 12 tribes of Israel. If you look at a map of the Middle East today, there he is, Israel. All of this starting with a man with a bloody nose a split lip, and who walks with a limp. You know, the hope for us is that God can take a messed up life full of deceit, anger, and whatever else and make of it something special. And God blesses Jacob, Israel. And I wonder how this blessing looked. I kind of imagine Jacob on his knees and the hand of God on his head as he blesses him. Jacob becomes here an overcomer. Now, we not, may not be wrestling as such with another person at the moment. However, I suspect there are many of us here who can relate to Jacob. You may feel like you've got a bloody nose, a split lip, or you're walking with a limp. <laughs> Some of you, literally. Well, if you do, why not join Jacob, who hung on in there and fought for a blessing 
from God. I can't guarantee that God will set you free from all the situations that you may face. But you know what? I'd rather walk with a limp and know God's blessing than to walk well but not know his blessing on my life. I hope in this story today there's something that you can take that will encourage you, that will encourage you to stick in there as you seek a blessing from God, whatever that means for you. Because God, for each of us, as he did with Jacob, despite his mistakes, God has good plans for each of us. Amen? Amen. Next week, we'll look at another failed, messed up guy called Jonah and see how God could even use him and a whale along the way. So we pray? Father, we thank you for this account that we get, this rather bizarre account in Scripture. Most of all, we thank you that you can look at somebody like Jacob, who made so many mistakes, who didn't deserve your favor, yet your grace is such that you chose to bless him. And that blessing has continued for centuries since. And I pray for each of us that are here today, either in person or watching uh, later online, that you'd encourage each of us in our lives as we seek after you to be willing to enter into it for the long run, knowing that it may seem sometimes like a bit of a struggle, but that you ultimately know our names and that your plans are for our good and for our prosperity. So would you speak hope into each of our lives and help us to walk with your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.